welcome to a, I think, kind of special edition here at the Dividend Cafe. Uh, it's definitely going to be a little bit different than normal. Um, more or less, I just want to kind of give the talk that mirrors what I wrote about in Dividend Cafe uh, this week over at DividendCafe.com. The uh, uh, events of 9-11, of course, have uh, inspired this week's Dividend Cafe, and and basically for the reasons that should be obvious, that we're we're looking at the 20 year anniversary of this event, and and not only do I I personally, and and you know I think just from those of us who who have strong feelings about the events of that weekend, there there's a lot to be said there, but to the extent that Dividend Cafe is obviously a very specific investment commentary, I think there are just profound lessons to be extracted from, from all of this. And so I want to pull all that together for you. Um, when I wrote Divin Cafe last night, I was uh, on the airplane flying from Los Angeles to Nashville, where I'm, I'm sitting right now in my hotel room, getting ready for a day of meetings and a speaking event and some other things. And, and um, the uh, flight in Los Angeles was delayed about four and a half hours just on the ground. It, we found out well into the process that Vice President Kamala Harris, who had been visiting LA, was going to be leaving. And that more or less, for like a hundred mile radius, all the airspace had been shut down. And so there was something in the range of 110 planes that were off of their gates and not able to, to leave. And so, you know, it all kind of worked out. My wife and I didn't get to uh, our hotel room till three o'clock in the morning. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it was obviously one of those travel inconveniences. I, I think a lot of people have experienced, I'm blessed because I travel a lot and I haven't had too many of these. I've had, I've had some various delays and weather things and stuff. It happens. Uh, I've become real resilient to it. Just kind of go with the flow. But for the most part, I've been a pretty blessed traveler, but I was thinking about, um, Back in, in September of 2001, Jolene and I uh, had been married on September 8th, and uh, the first couple of days after, we were in uh, Los Angeles, and we you know, had family events, and we we're at a nice hotel up in, in Bel Air, and then we're doing a flight to, to Tahiti for what was going to be a two-week honeymoon, and we were leaving on a red eye out of LAX on the night of September 10th, landing on the morning of September 11th in Tahiti. And so it's one of those things where, um, you know, uh, Varney on Fox Business just asked me this morning where I was on 9-11. Almost every adult, you know, remembers where they were and associates some, some part of it. I mean, uh, you know, what, what was going on, the events of that day, those are not the types of things that you easily forget. And particularly based on the drama of our situation, starting off our honeymoon with this horrific event. Uh, it's obviously something um, that that we'll never forget uh, for all the different reasons. But uh, when we were coming back from from Tahiti to LA, it was the first day they had reopened travel back into LAX, and we were stuck on the ground in Papete, Tahiti, that day four and a half hours as well. And so we have these two bookends of of these long air, airplane delays. But um, if you go back in time to the events of September 11th, 2001, and now switch gears a little to thinking about from, from an investment standpoint, and, and even apart from an investor context, which is where I'm going to spend most of our time here in a moment, just specifically um, the, the economic anxiety. It's really important to remember what people were saying and thinking. They were not fringe. They're not extreme. It was not perceived as, as overdone or sensationalized. You know, I was a, a young man, now newlywed, working in finance. Markets crashed thousands of points. First of all, the stock exchange for the first time ever had been shut down for, for the whole remainder of that week. Uh, my wife at the time was working in marketing at an ad agency, and her, her, her account was the Hilton um, Hotel chain, uh, Corporation. And of course, everyone says, well, tourism's dead, travel's dead, hotel, air, airfare, uh, airlines, all that stuff. You know, it's interesting how much of this kind of had certain rhymes and, and, and uh, what precedent with what we then saw again in COVID. But um, yeah, that, 
I mean, there's no need to lie about it or anything. It's kind of obvious. There was a lot of economic insecurity and anxiety and questioning on a macro level for our whole country. But, but you know, I, I spent part of my honeymoon wondering if we were too soon to be unemployed newlyweds. You just, you just didn't know what was going on. But then on top of that, you know, the whole risk premium of economic life in the United States changed. And I'm, I don't think I can tell you to this day that somewhere deeply buried in trillions of price signals that are markets, that there isn't today a risk premium that accounts for the reality of terrorism, the reality of, of a potential large um, uh, attack. And I recall um, right after 9-11, Warren Buffett and Vice President Cheney both referring to the inevitability, not the likelihood or the increased risk, but they spoke as if it were at some point kind of obviously going to happen, that there'd be even a nuclear attack on the soil of the continental United States. And, and so uh, a lot of things had to get repriced and get re repriced quickly. And unlike COVID, when that hit and we were in this really positive economic time and markets had just come off in 2019, this phenomenally strong year, you got to remember, too, that when the terrorists attacked our world's, uh, our, the world's financial capital on September 11th, 2001, we were still reeling from the um, massive collapse in the technology sector, the dot-com bubble burst, the NASDAQ implosion. Uh, we were teetering on recession. We did end up going into recession in 2002. Uh, that the, all all the 9/11 stuff happened just before the Enron scandal, and then into 2002, you had other accounting scandals and WorldCom, and and so there was there there was just a period of time. Let's see, that would have been about 18 months into what ended up being a 30 month bear market. So there there was a lot of pain and agony in financial markets, and of course, just the utter. Um, agony over what had happened, what had been considered to be unthinkable, that not only the United States could be attacked on its own soil, on, on the continental soil that previously had been reasonably protected by an ocean on each side, but that it had been attacked by a non-nation state actor, a terrorist cell that was highly resourced, highly organized, highly capitalized, but nevertheless not even connected to a nation that had a flag on it and, and, and so forth. And so um, a lot changed. And yet the thing that I believe is so simple and so redundant, and I just don't care, it has to be said, is in that moment, like the financial crisis that would come seven months later, which was far more existentially threatening to specifically to financial institutions and and credit markets and financial confidence in a global economic order. Um, and then, of course, the, the COVID moment um, of a year and a half ago, you know, we're just 20 years into this new century. And I am aware it's also a new millennium, but that's it, it's a bit more appropriate for our context uh, to think of the new century when you're talking about markets year over year, decade over decade, these kinds of things. This has been a very unsettling first 20 years. If you had said at 2000, like I remember everyone being all afraid about this Y2K nonsense, but ignore that because that obviously was a nothing burger. But um, if you had said right after you know the, the century started that within a year, you're going to have the worst terrorist attack on American soil in history and, and 3,000 people are going to die and, and we're going to have these prolonged wars and other things in the aftermath. Um, and that the reality of the sort of jihadist threat against uh, America was going to take center stage, that we would then have seven years later, the biggest financial crisis since the Great Depression and markets would drop over 50% and that housing prices would collapse and that massive financial institutions uh, would go down, uh, largest bankruptcies in American history. And that then um, years later, you would have the, the biggest global pandemic since the Spanish flu and, 
and hundreds of thousands of uh, fatalities and, and a government that would shut down the entire country first uh, holistically and then kind of partially for a long, long time. So you describe these three events and the drama of what we've lived through. And, and then I were, and then said, oh, and the market is going to go from, you know, from 8,000 to 35,000. Uh, the S and P's percentage increase even higher than that. Uh, yeah, I think you you could be uh, forgiven for for laughing at that idea that that could happen. Uh, well, why has it happened? Um, it's happened for the very reason that we invest in equities to begin with. Uh, we invest in equities to begin with because we believe in free enterprise, and we believe in free enterprise because we believe in the indomitability of the human spirit. We believe in the resourcefulness and the creative capacity of mankind created by God to overcome brutal events and to operating in their own self-interest, looking for a better life for themselves, their families, their communities, and their country, to create the environment that produces corporate profits that become investable to us as investors. This is the underlying thesis of equity ownership. It is not PE ratios. It is uh, underneath all of the math and all of the mechanics and how you get to earnings and to dividends and to cash flows, all those things become accounting constructs that matter for investors. But underneath that, before there can be any of that, there are human beings acting that create a profitable environment that becomes investable for us. So we get to take our long-term financial goals and we get to tie them to the long-term realities of the human spirit. That's why we invest in equities. And that's why we have overcome the tragic events of 9-11 and the subsequent disasters that I spoke about as well. It is why really bad things can happen in short-term periods, but that longer-term investors who have maintained that faith and that outlook and that perspective and that behavioral alignment from their portfolio to this philosophy have been so richly rewarded. So while I believe that those uncertainty spikes are rational, it was not crazy to wonder if people were going to travel again or what was going to happen to, to financial markets or how big cities were going to fare out of 9-11 or for that matter, out of COVID, you know, all these things. Um, I guess sometimes I'm critical of people that are, are permanently pessimistic or are prone to just continue to fall back to the same lines only to the extent that they just don't seem to learn from the history of it, that maybe next time you predict no one's ever going to fly again, even when it seems like maybe they won't, but that you can realize, well, I've said that before and before and before, and there's all these different times that these kinds of things have seemed to make sense at the time and they prove not to. And so maybe this time it won't make sense also. I don't, you know, but, but human nature is not necessarily always like that. And I get it. I really do. But what I want for investors, when, when, when we as human beings who, who mourn the loss of life and, and we as human beings look uh, upon the heroism that took place from so many on 9-11, all of those very important aspects to the remembrance of this solemn occasion, uh, when we switch into our, our the, wearing the hat of an investor as an economic actor and think about what has happened in the 20 years since 9-11, I think this is the takeaway that those who uh, practice good behavior around a soundly constructed, um, well-positioned, properly allocated portfolio, and from there maintain their belief in the principles that help to construct that portfolio to begin with, that they succeed. They overcome very, very difficult times. Short-term occasions are going to be horrific in our portfolios, in other circumstances in life too, but I'm saying, we cannot control how markets will respond immediately to uncertain events, unpredictable events. You cannot hedge. You cannot time. You cannot do anything about these types of events like global pandemics, jihadist terrorist attacks, and great financial crises. What you can do is, in those moments, remember why the portfolio is constructed the way it is, and remember the lesson of history. And history did not start in 2000 or 2001. We had plenty of horrific and, dare I say, existential events in the 20th century as well, and overcame those as well through the Cold War, through a couple of world wars, through a Great Depression, through the awfulness of the 1960s and 70s, 
Yeah, awful in so many ways. Here we are. So we um, do not forget the lessons of 9-11. And what I mean by that is, of course, on a minor scale, what that means to us as investors and on a more significant scale, what it means to us as Americans. Uh, I pray we will never forget. Thank you for listening to this edition of Dividend Cafe. Those watching the video, listening on podcast, we appreciate your support and welcome any questions, comments, anytime. Uh, have yourself a wonderful weekend. Never forget. Mm -hmm.